Um, so this is The Voice, how to write realistic dialogue in games. I'm Amanda Gardner. I'm going to start with a little bit about myself. So I wasn't in game development as recently as four years ago. Four years ago, completely different life. I was an English teacher. I was a novelist. Um, I had two little boys. And my husband had this really cool job in AAA. He worked on this game called Bioshock. Um, <laughs> And Bioshock Infinite. So that was our, our, our life. You know, I was a teacher and, and, and a writer, and he was in games. And I always loved games, and I've been a gamer my whole life, but I wasn't involved. Um, and then Irrational closed about six months after I quit my teaching job to stay at home with the kids. So pivot, right? You gotta just, you gotta do what you gotta do. Um, and then I, okay, so it completely skipped a slide that had a great picture, and I'm super disappointed about it. Um, but basically, uh, we started our own studio, so we founded the Deep End Games, and um, I wrote my first game, Perception. It came out on pretty much all the systems in 2017, Switch, etc. Um, I now have four kids. For those of you who haven't heard my talk, for those of you who haven't heard my talk on uh, self care and uh, crunch, I had a newborn, a toddler, two elementary schoolers, and crunch. It's my GDC talk. It's pinned to my profile on Twitter if you want to catch it. It talks about how to de-stress. I'm also a meditation teacher because that was the craziest time of my life. But we're not here to talk about meditation today. We're here to talk about dialogue. And games have a bad rap. I wonder why. Um, so let's walk through one of the classics. Um, so Richter. Die, monster. You don't belong in this world. It was not by my hand that I'm once again given flesh. I was called here by humans who wish to pay me tribute. Tribute, you steal men's souls and make them your slaves. That's like the classic line. And the next one, coming up. Uh, perhaps it could be same of all religions. Well, how is that even relevant? Uh, <laughs> uh, like, who's even talking about religion? Um, your words are as empty as your soul. Mankind ill needs a savior such as you. And here comes the big one. What is a man? A miserable pile. Oh, I should have knocked my glasses on, but it has a latte. A miserable little pile of secrets. But enough talk, haven't you? Okay. This is problematic. It's not just in the translation, but I mean, it's overkill on top of overkill with a cherry on top. Um, it's, it's trying too hard. And that is a big problem that games have in dialogue, is that typically the bad dialogue in games is when you're going overboard and, and, and trying too hard. Um, so, sorry, I'm having some like technical hoo-ha here. Um, sorry about that, guys. Oh, jeez. Oh, okay, so some other classic lines that we're trying too hard. Do you think love can bloom even on the battlefield? I mean, who has ever actually said that and did? I don't know. Um, hey dudes, thanks for rescuing me. Let's go for a burger. Ha! 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 I love the punctuation on that. Uh, it might come in handy if you, the master of unlocking, take it with you. I mean, once again, like, overwrought, trying too hard. Um, and, and that is a, they're hyperbolic and unnatural, is what I have to say about that. Um, and, sorry, like, I don't know. So, but games can have fantastic writing. Um, but it's often not the dialogue, it's often the monologues. And I'm going to talk about why later. But you have this, uh, the great quote from Portal 2 about blowing up lemons. Uh, I'm going to try to save a little time. We all make choices, but in the end, our choices make us. Not nepotism here, but Bioshock, I mean, you know. Um, and then stand among the ashes of a trillion dead souls and ask the ghost if honor matters. Silence is your answer. Mass Effect, love it. Um, so we can transcend the medium, uh, but oftentimes it's not in the, in the dialogue between characters. Now, just so you know, in this presentation, I'm gonna be saying dialogue, but I'm also gonna mean monologues. I'm also gonna mean audio logs, because games just have a different perspective, a different point of view, and um, we have to sort of adapt to that. Games aren't film, and I'm gonna talk about a lot of that. Okay, so, uh, love that little Navi. So, one of the things that you really ought to do is attune yourself, so surround yourself with good dialogue. Um, I'm gonna have sort of like a list of really great movies that have um, dialogue that's worth studying, not just, not just watching, but like engaging in. Um, also, be able to attune your ears to bad dialogue. There's this great quote, um, 
I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. And that's about porn. Uh, but it's the same with bad dialogue. And let's not even get into, get into bad dialogue and porn. But you'll know bad dialogue when you hear it. Um, you'll develop a mouthfeel for it. Your, your ears will sort of instantly start hitting that, that's good, that's bad, that's good, that's bad, if you take enough notes. Um, and listen, reflect, and write. That's my mantra with pretty much everything absorb it, but then reflect on it and take a minute to get it down on paper because you will forget. That is a fact. It's not just because I'm turning 40, I forget everything if I don't write it down. Um, and mindful movie watching. So I said that I'm not talking about meditation in this, but this is more of being fully involved um, in this experience of really taking in the dialogue, stopping, deconstructing, reflecting, and writing. Um, and to understand the constraints of game writing, like I said, a lot of the good stuff is in the monologues. Why? Let's find out. Okay. I am so sorry. This is really laggy and weird. Okay, so games versus film. Uh, so this picture uh, of Andy Serkis and, um, and Gollum sort of illustrates that video game characters were, were still in the Uncanny Valley stage. Like, no matter how good it looks, it still does not have the nuance of the full range of human expression. Right? So, whereas film can rely on that subtle shift, that slight eyebrow tilt, um, we're still not there with games yet. Um, and so that's part of the reason why the, sometimes the lines go overboard. Um, and, sorry, this is totally screwing up my pacing. Uh, I know you guys are gonna be like, but The Last of Us! <laughs> so, The Last of Us is so close. It's so good. And we as gamers, when we watch it, we're like, this is the stuff right here. But to non-gamers, they're like, those aren't people. <laughs> and, and maybe in five or ten years, we're gonna be like, that was good for the time. But it still hasn't got there yet. And I love it, like, believe me. Um, and that's often why the best games with the best dialogue go cartoony. Because if you're not trying to match the nuance of human emotion and you go cartoony, and we're gonna talk about Grim Fandango and why it does a, a, a great job, but that, that sort of compensates for the uh, lack of human emotion. Okay, so in games, characters are in different spaces a lot of the time. Um, and in movies, they say, they say get off the phone. The number one like rule of screenplay writing, my husband went to school for screenplay writing, and I've read a lot of books and screenplays, they say get your characters off the phone and don't have them drinking coffee or tea. Because with the phone, you don't have that intimacy, you don't have the chemistry, um, and with games, if, you're, if you've got two characters on the screen and they're not doing anything, and it's a companion character, it does not have that chemistry. So oftentimes, we're listening to audio logs, we're listening to characters on the phone, and we're listening to characters in radio. So most of the time, the dialogue is not two people up close. So sorry, I don't know why this is being funny. Okay, Firewatch is a great example of how to transcend this and actually use it to your benefit, however. So the characters in this game, they rely on the radio and the, the great dialogue um, really helps make the distance work to the game's advantage, okay? Um, it really heightens that sort of sexual tension between the characters, that sort of unrequited feeling, and the distance between them and just the radio, like we don't see Delilah, that's actually working in the game's benefit. They're embracing the constraints. My husband actually has a talk on embracing constraints in games at three, so it's not a plug, but it's a plug. Um, <laughs> And I just really like that line, just remember you're here, it's beautiful, and escaping isn't always something bad. Love that. So I'm going to just read a little bit, in case you can't see it, um, some really great uh, dialogue between Henry and Delilah, and we'll talk about why it's so great. So the bag had a name, Brian Goodwin sewn into the top. I actually found some of his stuff back in my desk. Huh, wow, do you know him? Yeah, I just haven't heard that name in a few years. He was a lookout? Lookout? Huh, uh, kinda, I guess. Was he a ranger or something? Ranger, oh no, no. What, was he a fellow you had a thing with, ex-lover? Oh yeah, it was hot and heavy. Of course, Brian Good was, was 12 years old, so our love could never really be understood. Yuck. I'm kidding, not about him being actually 12 years old, that part's true. What's great about this is, so you have already established that they're in separate locations, there's some sexual tension, and 
there's sort of just this play between them. She drags this shit out. Look at it. Like, she's not giving him direct answers. It's teasing. It's slow. And by the time he gets to, like, what, is he your lover? Like, he's boiling up with, like, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Who is this guy? And that's why it's got that escalation, and it just really works. And then, and then the de-escalation is very clever, lets the air out of the tires in a comedic way. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really good example of embracing that constraint of, okay, these people are not together on their own. They're on the radio. Um, give your character something to do. And this is where we get to Grim Fandango. Um, so, Snappy, the, I'm gonna read the dialogue first. So, Manny is the protagonist. Um, can I have one of your clients? He's talking to this guy who's like kind of a higher up. Sure, Cal, just as soon as I can uh, get one you can handle. Manny, I can handle anything you got, especially if it's your best right jab. Is it hard to kiss up to the boss that much with no lips? Hey, I got all the lip I need, I get it from you. So what's great about this is it's snappy, it communicates a lot, and it relates to the action that Domino's doing. Domino is there with the punching bag. Give your character something to do or it's gonna look like the conversations in Mass Effect where they're just standing there. Nothing against Mass Effect, nothing but love for Mass Effect. But, but this, it's engaging, they're doing something. And that is really, really helpful when you have dialogue. Even, I mean, even just watching him sort of go like this makes it a little bit more interesting than literally people just standing there. Um, and what's great about Grin Fandango is every conversation, somebody has a physical activity that they're doing. When Manny goes up to the guy making balloon animals, he's actually making the balloon animals. When he talks to the, um, the secretary and they have that really funny flirtatious banter, she's always typing and trying to blow him off because she's busy. They have something to do. Okay, I'm um, going to read this little one from uh, Half-Life. I don't know if this is Half-Life or Half-Life 2. But the Half-Life series is really great because they're often doing things independently. They're often on keyboards. And then when you come into the picture, they make you feel special. But it makes you feel like they're living their own lives and doing their own things and not standing there like a bunch of weirdos just waiting for you. Um, so the dialogue, we can't keep him here long, Doc. It'll jeopardize everything we've worked for. Don't worry, he's coming with me. That's right, Barney, this is a red letter day. We'll inaugurate the new teleport with a double transmission. You mean it's working for real this time? Because I still have nightmares about that cat. What cat? No, 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 there's nothing to be worried about. We've made some major strides since then, major strides. What cat? <laughs> So this is great. It communicates a lot without info dumping, okay? Info dumping is the enemy. We're going to talk about that later. Um, but it communicates. It keeps the ball rolling. It's got a little bit um, of that sort of snappy humor at the end. Let's, like I said, let's the air out of the tires in a good way. Um, so here are just the people standing still in that spot. And like I said, love it, love it, love it. But they do sort of just stand there often. And it's nicer to have people doing things. Um, my introduction to bad dialogue, in case you were wondering where I started to notice it, it was in high school, and it went a little something like this. You vaguely resemble the boy I had the time of my life with last summer. Come on up here. Melanie Shea Thompson. I always thought I had this funny feeling our paths were going to cross again. What took you so long? I got busy. Got busy. Sounds like code for you started dating guys more appropriate to your station in life. These are 14 year olds. Have you met a 14 year old? Like, have you met a teenager and has any of them said anything remotely like this? So, I was a teenager. Like, I'm, I'm older than most of you. I was a teenager watching Dustin's Creek go and my bullshit detector was like, woo, woo, woo. Like, we don't talk like that. You guys are, this is not working. Um, and I have another quote. I'm going to try to get past it, but I, I really have a takeaway here. Uh, so another quote from Dawson's Creek that's just epic. <laughs> just what would be missing from the land of poorly scripted melodramas, huh? Recycled plot lines, tiresome self-realizations. You throw in the occasional downward spiral of a dear friend, maybe a baby here, a death there, and all you've really got is a recipe for some soul-sucking, mind-numbing ennui, and I, for one, could skip it. <laughs> okay, so it's what, this could be good writing, and I have a big asterisk here. It could be good if that's one character who talks like that. That's his thing, he uses big words, he's really funny, he's really clever, he's really off the cuff, ha ha. Everybody talks like this. They're sitting at the lunch table talking about their books and being like, it's vapid, trite, and derivative, and falls completely apart in the third act. No, you can't, you can't have 
multiple characters talking in such an unrealistic way. So, like I said, it's, it's the kind of thing you would tune your ears to, and this is how I got attuned, so. <laughs> that phase though, right? Okay, so fantastic movie dialogue. Um, Chinatown is really, really, really fantastic. Um, for, for time's sake, I'm just gonna let you read it to yourself because I wanna talk a bit about what to do when watching Chinatown. Um, so one of the best screenplay writing books I've ever read, and it's actually pretty much considered the Bible if you go to film school, is Story by Robert McKee. And, in, and he's sort of like the script doctor, script writer, like he's, he's worked with all of the best talent. And in, in story, he literally takes Chinatown and breaks it down beat by beat and explains why this is so brilliant, why it works, what doesn't work. Micro beats, not even like, like an entire story arc. We're talking up note, down note, up note, down note. Totally brilliant. Um, and what I would do, I actually, on my next slide about like recommendations for film, I would say watch Chinatown, read story, watch it again, and just watch your mind fizz like you just dropped the mento and coke. It's like, woo, mind blown, so good. So Chinatown, it's old uh, and it's noir, but it, it, like, I like that, but um, it's, so the dialogue's very distinctive, um, but it's just really, really great. Sorry. I don't understand why this is going so slow. Okay, so some more great movie dialogue. I will read this one because I think that it's really great to deconstruct. So how many of you have not seen The Big Lebowski? It's great. It's fantastic. It's just a bunch of unusual people who should never really be hanging out together. Um, and this scene really encapsulates that weird fish out of water and they're all fish out of water and everybody... Okay, so... Rug peers do not do this. I mean, look at it. Young trophy wife marries a guy for money, but figures he isn't giving her enough. She owes money all over town. That fucking bitch. It's all a goddamn fake. Like Lennon said, look for the person who will benefit, and you will, uh, no, you'll, uh, you know what I'm trying to say. I am the walrus. That fucking bitch. <laughs> yeah, I am the walrus. Shut the fuck up, Johnny. V.I. Lennon, Vladimir, Ilyich, Yulianov. Okay, what the, the humor here is that they're talking about two different Lennons. John Lennon from the Beatles, I am the walrus, and you know, Lennon, <laughs> right? Um, and they're just weird people, and, and, and it's about LA and how nobody connects, and this is such a great example of dialogue because it shows they're not connecting. Like, like the ball is not hitting the racket. Like, there, there's just, there's some disconnect here, and this is just a really, really cute way to uh, encapsulate that. And like I said, this is just sort of like surround yourself with, with, with good stuff, and so I, I highly re recommend um, watching this for, for dialogue. Ooh, wee doggy, this is just not having fun responding to me today. Okay, so my list. Okay, so Chinatown and then read Story by Robert McKay. Big Lebowski, or honestly, any Coen Brothers movie, literally anyone. Um, we just watched The Ballad of Buster Scruggs and it's awesome, although the monologues in that are what I would look for, not necessarily the dialogue. Um, Wolf of Wall Street, similar monologues, but The Departed, dialogue. Dialogue, 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 delicious. Um, lots of translation, beautiful, really just ruminate on it, watch it, like sit and soak it in, so good. Um, Fight Club, very snappy, very fun, and also uh, monologue heavy. Um, oh, Lost in Translation shows up again because I want you to watch it that badly. Okay. It would be nice if this was like cooperative. Okay, you want your dialogue to be realistic, but not too realistic. And this quote really encapsulates this. A good story is life with the dull parts taken out. Okay? So you are going to write and then you are going to cut. And then you are going to cut so much that you think you've destroyed it and then it's right. Um, so cut any pleasantries. You look at your script and they're just, uh, hey Jane, glad you could make it. Like, nope, nope. People do pleasantries. Your script does not need it. Cut any small talk. Well, how about that cold snap last week? Unless it drives characterization or plot forward, you do not need it. Trust me on this. And lastly, oh my God, filler words. I have a filler word that I use all the time. And every time I do it, I, it's just. I throw the word just into everything. So there are so many words that you can cut out. So look at the difference between, hey, listen, I just want to talk about Leslie, you know, to I want to talk about Leslie. It's forceful, it's powerful, it's snappy, okay? So um, just an anecdote, when we were writing Perception, 
Um, I really was happy with the intro scene. I was really psyched. Um, Bill took it to one of his mentors, uh, and his mentor was like, this is awesome. Cut it by two thirds. <gasps> I still have goosebumps when I think about it. I was like, two thirds? I, I was like, he means one third. He's like, two thirds. So I went there and I just slashed and hacked and it was bloody and it was horrible, but then it came out so much tighter and I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. I didn't need any of that stuff anyway. So you're gonna cut, it's gonna be uncomfortable, but it will be so much better in the end. You just can't be precious about it. Like the whole kill your darlings, like brutalize them. You just, you're gonna have to. Um, oh, and now it's doing this. That's, that's cool. Okay, so um, dialogue master Elmore Leonard shows his first draft of a couple of lines from Out of Sight. Has anybody seen Out of Sight? That's one that Bill says is like, you gotta watch it for dialogue. I haven't seen it and he got mad. Um, so anyway, the original exchange went, I heard your dog was killed. Yes, got run over by a car. What'd you call it? It was a she, I called her Tuffy. And he just cut just a few little things and it just sounds so much more natural. Uh, your dog was killed, got run over by a car. What'd you call it? It was a she named Tuffy. So much shorter, and for these characters, it was just, it was the right thing to do. And Elmore Leonard is sort of like the, the master of like cutting short, snappy, etc. I say snappy a lot, but it's true. Like, like, like punchy, lines that just sort of flow without any extra fat. Um, so these are cliches and pet peeves, and these are my pet peeves. So some of you may be able to do this masterfully, but when I see it, I want to um, choke on my own vomit. Okay, so <laughs> saying a phrase a second time. Don't do it, George. Don't do it. Like, when people do that little echo, that second drive, like, Joyce, you can't leave me here. You can't leave me here, Joyce. Like, just, no, 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 no. Drives me nuts. Um, using people's names too much. In life, how often do you actually say a person's name? Maybe if you're introducing yourself, or like, oh my god, Joey, it's been 10 years. But then you're not like, so Joey, tell me about home. And Joey, your mom's so funny. And Joey, Joey, Joey. You don't do that. It's not normal. Cut it from your dialogue. Um, info dumping. So um, all I'm going to say is just, I, and I had a nice little picture of Brian the dog. Watch Family Guy and watch what Brian the dog does. All he does is move the story forward. Because Family's Guys, there's a bunch of weird clips about things that are unrelated, and the dog comes on and actually tells you the plot, tells you what's going on, moves the story forward, and he info dumps. Like, he just sort of gives us all of this information, and we're just like, thanks, dog. Um, but try to avoid info dumps in your story, and when you work, you can work it into your dialogue and your monologues cleverly. Just don't have a Brian the dog. Um, an abundance of proper nouns. Okay, let me just tell you first off, my genre is fantasy. I've been reading fantasy since I was five years old and it's my, it's my jam, okay? But like, the proper nouns in fantasy have got to go. Um, <laughs> like, I just started a new series a few weeks ago and it was amazing, but I'm not kidding, like, and this isn't it, because I don't wanna, I don't wanna name names. But like, literally the first line had, first paragraph had eight proper nouns. And I'm like, slow your roll, buddy. Like, we need to like get used to this world and this people. So, in fantasy, proper nouns, take it easy, people. Um, that's, that's just my thing. Do, 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 and it's doing that thing again that it didn't do before. I love how like you hook it up to a different computer and just like different things happen. It's like, I'm just gonna throw this at you. Okay. Um, Show, don't tell. I, I'm, I'm starting to run down the clock a little bit because of the tech issue, so I'm gonna go a little fast. Show, don't tell. That's the number one rule everybody talks about, but it's true. Wouldn't you rather see something happening than hear a recap of it? Pregnant pauses. What's left unsaid says more. Um, and in a game, silence is really noticeable, and it's awkward, and it makes you ask what's going on. So I would have to say that, that when you have a character and you choose to have them not answer a question or answer it differently after a pause, it's really impactful. Cutting people off. People don't do this in games. So in movies, when you, have, I say the closer the relationship, the more you cut each other off because you have this shorthand, um, you sort of have this, usually you've had these conversations before and you know what the person's gonna say. But oh my God, like people, we don't speak in full sentences. Like if you've ever read a Trump speech, you'll know that for a fact. <laughs> um, but like we, we don't, that's just not how we talk. We don't talk in paragraphs. We, 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 we cut ourselves off. We start another sentence mid-sentence because we remember something. I'm sure if somebody was dictating what I'm saying right now, I would be a little embarrassed to read it. But we cut each other off. We even cut ourselves off. So um, feel free to just stop 
in the middle of a line and have somebody fill in the blanks. Um, and I, I mentioned this before. If you have a cancer ca um, character who's answering a different question, it's an interesting dodge. You know, like, where were you last night? Did you see the, the, the dodge that out? Like, oh, wait. Why, why did you just dodge that? So that's just like a little way to do, do a pause, but in a different way. Alt lines. Oh my god, I'm obsessed with alt lines. Um, I made my job way too hard for myself in perception, but it worked out so well for us. So um, in perception, in one of the first scenes, we have a mentor character who's essentially teaching people what echolocation is and how Cassie can use it. So this is really easy to get wrong. It can sound super ham-fisted and crummy, right? So I wrote a zillion outlines and had um, the actor read them, and then we picked the best one, the one that made the most sense. But sometimes the more outlines you write, um, the more options you give yourself, and it gives the um, it gives the actor more to play with. So I I loved having different ways of trying to explain what echolocation is. So remember, focus on perceptual awareness. Sound is your light. Tap your cane. Remember, focus on perceptual awareness. Listen, though you may feel lost in darkness, Cain is your light. You have your own light, Cassie, all around you. This was our way of communicating to the player that, yes, this game does have vision, but you use sound. So this was our way of doing that, and I wrote a million outlines for it. Um, uh, I had to early on establish what her relationship with her boyfriend was like. I wanted to show that she was independent, but I also want to show that she had people that cared about her, but that didn't want to step on her toes too much. And I wanted to walk that line and see which line really sounded right. So I wrote all of these. I wrote all of these, and I had our awesome actor, Elaine Mesa, he just read them all, and he did them a couple times, and we picked the one that just felt right. So all lines are okay, all lines are good, all lines are your friends. Um, say it out loud. A little twilight nod there. Read your script out loud for Christ's sakes. It, like, you will notice instantly when a, sign, when a line sounds off. You will notice instantly when it sounds awkward. If your mouth trips over something, it's not you. It's the line. Trust me. Unless you're drunk. Um, <laughs> take notes. Take copious notes. When I said um, watch a movie, I want you, like those movies, watch them. Wait for a line that catches your interest. Pause it. Reflect on the line. Write down what it is that was good about it. This worked because it was ironic. This worked because it was a double entendre. This worked because of this. Keep a journal with phrases that you really like. Um, Bill was telling me about one of his friends um, grabbed just a little phrase from a movie he loved and put it in a game, and it worked really well in the game, but it wasn't plagiarism because it was just like a, a little interesting turn of phrase. Keep that stuff, it's important. Jot down scenes from movies and TV games you enjoy and, and reflect on it. Really think about why, why does this work, why do you like it? Um, create a playlist of great characters, lines, and scenes on YouTube. This is great, I love to have a repository of clips that are just awesome that I wanna use as reference um, in, in my games. Um, let's see, notice, repeat, reflect, repeat, right? Oh, it's doing the thing, yay, fabulous. So those of you who come to my talk at uh, two, I, I'm gonna make sure that it doesn't do this. So edit, revise, edit, revise. You are going to go, like when your script is first written, Charles Dickens said the first draft of anything is shit. And I agree. You are going to revise it so many times. It's fine. Just keep cutting. Just keep swimming. Everything's going to be just fine. Just go over it as many times as you can. Read it out loud, out loud as many times as you can. Um, recommended reading. If everybody's going to screenshot, this is the time. Um, story by Robert McKee. If you are a writer, you have to read. You have to read. It's absolutely the most brilliant work on writing screenplays. AKA also games, because I wrote mine as a script, as a screenplay uh, in Perception, just with a bazillion alt lines. Um, save the Cat. If you're newer to writing and really want to like get that story arc, Save the Cat is the easiest way to get a story arc. It's brilliant, easy. I actually have given it in the past to my students who are writing, writing stories. I was like, you guys, if you save the cat, natural, fantastic. Bird by bird, on writing and writing down the bones. Those are all on craft, so that's that's like more, I would say that that's more advanced, um, but story and save the cat. If you're a game writer, it's at the top. So, the pen is mightier than the sword. That was actually me at our wedding. Um, so, uh, you can reach me. I love to, to talk to people and stay in touch and whatnot. You can uh, email me, you can at me on Twitter. Um, I mean, Facebook, I guess. And if you wanna check out Perception or anything, 
thedeependgames.com. Um, thank you guys so much. I'm sorry I'm right down to the wire. I apologize for that. Um, but I hope you got something out of it and um, write some good dialogue. Woo, thank you.